Uh, actually, can I take that whole bit again? Yeah, sure. Uh, do you mind? I know it's quite let long. Me blow my nose, let me blow my nose first. <laughs> actually, a bad... Stop laughing. That's actually a really important phoneme in my con line. <laughs> Remember we offhandedly mentioned in the last show uh, about getting like an, an artifacts of space? Yeah. Which is obviously not going to happen, like, or at least not in the immediate future. Not in the next six months. Not in the next six months. It's possibly a bit of a liberal uh, estimation there, but, you know, fair enough. Um, but a uh, Redditor by, who goes by the handle you slash lawn, lawnmower parades? Lawnmower yep. parades. Um, came up with a couple of names that I just thought were really funny. Uh, and I'll just, I'll just list them out there. Uh, the Artifacts Complex, or Articomplex, slash Artiflex. The Artifactory, slash Artifexery. The Palace of Artifexia. <laughs> the Artifexian Manor. The Heart of Artifexia, <laughs> a.k.a. the Heartifexia. Bill and Edgar's Playground. And Bill and Ed's Excellent Adventureland. Now, out of those, Bill, right... What, what do you think is the best name? Well, I, I would like to point out that they're not really mutually exclusive. We can have multiple names. Is that not confusing, well, no? No, no, we can have multiple sites. I mean, I don't see Artifexian Manor as being a place where we we toil and, and do the world building and, and, you know, actually rule with an iron fist over Artifexia. Artifexian Manor is like our country estate. Oh yeah, that we where I go and I I can pretend to be like a Regency era uh, landlord. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I, Bill, you're so ambitious with these things. It's like I'm only thinking about having a nice place with a nice desk to make YouTube videos, but you're like, no, no, like we, we need proper real estate everywhere, manors, studios, yeah. towers. I like it. It's ambitious, yeah. Bill. Do you know what? We might go places. I think we will. I think we will. I like. Um, I like Bill and Ed's Excellent Adventure Land a lot because I like the film uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. I I like that one too. Although usually I'm against people calling me Ed. Like I really dislike that. Oh, um, do you? Yeah, because well, when I was younger, I used to hate the name Edgar because I was weird. Like I wanted to be called like Kevin or Sean or something, you know, so to, mm. like to be normal like all the rest of the kids. But as I grew up, I was like, I really like the name Edgar. It's kind of unique. And so when people shorten it to Ed, I'm kind of like, no, like, what are you doing? Like, I, I already have, a, like, a, a, I think an interesting name. Let's not make it boring. Like, I hate when people do that. And mm. also, people sometimes do it on the sort of, like, uh, pretense of, like, we're friends now. Like, very often I'll meet person, I meet, I meet a person once and I'll be like, oh, my name's Edgar. And they're like, great, Ed. And it's kind of like, we're not on Ed level here, pal. Like that's a bit presumptuous, isn't it? Yeah, it is a bit presumptuous. Like my name is Edgar, right? Like if we remain friends for a long time, possibly. But if we do remain friends, you'll see that I don't want Ed. So usually I'm against Ed, but I'll go with the pun for Bill and Ted, definitely. So that's mm. my that's my favorite. Bill and Ed's excellent adventure land. What a, what about shortening your name to Gar? Gar, but that sounds like it's like short for like Gary. Yeah, or it does. Garfield. Or what about Dega? De like, yeah. the, like the the DGA. <laughs> Hi, my name's Dega. Uh, yeah, that would be uh, interesting. I don't know about that one. It's certainly the most interesting of the lot of them, though. But I like Edgar. Edgar's good. I like Edgar as well, the... both as a name and as a person. Oh, oh God, sappiness, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> um, your name, right? Your yeah. your Bill. Are you Bill on your birth cert or are you William? No, I'm William. You're William, so how, like, mm. like seeing as everyone calls you Bill, you're obviously okay with the Bill thing, but, like, do you have any thoughts about this? Do you, would you be preferred, like, would you prefer if Artifexia referred to you as William? No. No? You prefer I Bill? I, no, I, I, I don't really have much of a preference. It's it's just, like, the William is my name, and the Bill is short for William, and I'll go by either of them. I don't, like, I don't usually go by Will or Billy or Oh, Willie. Billy. No, Billy, Billy, Billy and Willie is not... It's not good. Um, because uh, there are other people who I know, like like in my kind of immediate circles, called that. And I had like an uncle who was Billy, so we'd have the same name. So it would have been confusing for me to be called Billy as well. Hmm. Come here. Why is William shortened to Bill and not 
as standard will. Um, What's that about? You know, I actually, I read, I read the reason for this the other week, and I cannot remember it. But it happens a lot. This happens with Rob as well. Robert becomes Bob. Yeah. And Richard becomes Dick. That's really unfortunate. So there's a there's a few names, and I I did read the the reason for it recently, or at least a proposed reason. Um, and I cannot remember it right now. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. It's like I I I thought about it uh, a while back and was like, has it something to do with like place of articulation? Like you know, like W W is a labial sound, and then so is B. And is it just a thing where like it they're so the same that it like shifts over time? Say that again. So like it, I'm wondering, is the the bill coming from William? I wonder, is that like a function of a uh, uh, place uh, of articulation? Because, yeah. Yeah. Because like, okay. it would be weird if William shortened to like, I don't know, till. Like that would make no sense. But it seems like most of them tend to like shorten to a similar place of articulation. Now, I can't explain Rob and Bob. I don't know what's going on there. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's interesting. I don't know. I always wonder uh, that. It looks like here... It might just have been a a rhyming thing because people liked to use rhyming slang and r- rhyme names in the Middle Ages and that's where it comes from. Might be as simple as that. Oh. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Oh, so then like by, by extension, like my abbreviated name could be like Ted. <laughs> Shorten it down and rhyme it. Edgar, Ed, Ted. Or Edgar becomes... Oh, no, because he's always the first syllable, so Tar wouldn't really count now. No. Yeah, Ted, yeah. But, I mean, Eddie becomes Ted, so Edward becomes Ted, so it's exactly the same, yeah. Wait, does Edward become Ted? Does it just become Ed? Huh. Man, this is weird. I don't, I don't, I don't know, I don't like this. It just, it seems so strange. I'm glad you're comfortable with it, but it just seems like, it's really odd. William to Bill just seems like a total non sequitur. Um, I mean, I've I've had arguments with, uh, with people who, like, refuse to believe me that it was short for William. No, it's short for Billy. And I was like, okay, thank you. Yes, you you definitely know my name better than I do. <laughs> uh, I wonder, was has, was Billiam ever a word? Because I know you jokingly call yourself that sometimes. But I wonder... Or in German, it would be Billhelm. Billhelm. I like that. The Billhelm <laughs> scream. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's deeper um, than the other one. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Uh, yeah, there you go. Anyway, so there's a little bit about uh, names and what to call the artifacty artifacty space. I like Bill and Ned's excellent uh, Adventureland, and I think if we ever get a little studio, we we definitely need to put that um, in signage at the front. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So th- thanks, Lawn More Parades. That was a bit of crack. I really liked it. <laughs> um, so, do you have anything else to follow up? Um. No, we can look at some emails, maybe. Let's look at some emails. All right. Uh, so we've got one here about uh, pigeons and creoles from Anurin Hunt. Oh, who was on the show before, I think. Yes, we've, def- we've definitely mentioned them before. Mm. Um, the, they sent us a, a pretty cool link. I'd actually come across this before um, of the Basque Icelandic pigeon, which was spoken in Iceland in the 17th century. And it was, I guess, just a lot of Basque sailors happened to be living in Iceland and, like, settled there and formed a community. And they spoke a sort of a Basque Icelandic pigeon. Hmm. I've never heard um, that before. That's really interesting. Although, actually, well, to, to clarify, it's not, it was located in Iceland, but it wasn't a pigeon of Icelandic, it looks like. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't a pigeon of Icelandic. So it was just kind of like a, a sailor's a sailor's pigeon used by these Basque guys who happened to be living in Iceland. Huh. Which is just great. <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> what a mixture. Um, uh, the question is, do, do you know much about pigeons and creoles? Uh, it could be something to think about when world building and thinking about what languages are spoken and how much interaction there is. Um, if there is an, interna- an international language, it would make a pigeon useless. It won't emerge. Which kind of makes sense, yeah. If there's, if there's a well-used, uh, widely adopted ox line, there's no need for pigeons. Uh, would you consider trying to make one? And does this occur in your worlds? Um, 
As regards to the last point, would you consider trying to make one? Maybe not, because I'd want to develop my other conlangs more fully, first of all. Uh, but does it occur in your worlds? In theory, definitely, yeah. I, I absolutely... Um, I, I would add, because it's a real thing that happens in real languages, so it would make sense that I would consider it, at least theoretically, as a thing to happen in my uh, my fictional worlds. Um, about the, the aux line, certainly one of my settings does have a, a widely adopted sort of aux line. Um, uh, but that does uh, pigeonize and creolize quite a lot with local languages. Um, in my mind. I haven't done any of the work on that, but that's how I consider it. Um, but to be honest, I don't really know that much about pigeons and creoles. I think it would be an interesting conlanging exercise. Um, but it's a very... I, I, I think it's a very uh, difficult thing to, to, to replicate. I would imagine it would be a very difficult thing to replicate. I don't know if there's anyone who has looked into how pigeons and creoles arise and if you can predict what will come up by looking at the, the various parent languages. Um, yeah, I, I'd echo that because uh, usually when the thing is extremely difficult to do, it doesn't tend to show up in the world building literature all that much. Um, and I have not come across any language construction books yet that even remotely uh, delve into this topic at all. So I'd imagine it's really difficult to do. Um, and I, but I guess you could just make a language, just make it make a normal conlang and say that it's a pigeon or a creole. Well, the next step, I, the next thing I was going to say is that surely it would be a thing that you would do after you've done some conlang. Like you make up language A, you make up language B, and then you can kind of be like, that's what happens when we put them like, we take the grammar from A with some borrowed words from B or yeah. something like that. It feels like this would be a but, step. Like it wouldn't be a thing that you would do immediately. You would do all the normal stuff first, and then it would be like a last step to add like an extra layer of flavor. I don't know if you could really say that the like, pigeons are distinct from non-pigeons though i mean i think you could you could make up a language you could just like do a conlang and then say and this conlang happens to be a pigeon yeah that's fair i yeah. don't see why not yeah but uh... um on a real world topic uh in the last few months uh the bbc launched a west african pigeon version of their uh news website really yep huh yeah, I mean, it's it's spoken by millions of people in West Africa. Is the um, BBC a big thing in West Africa? It's big all over the world. Oh, is it? Is it? They've got the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, sure, I would, got, I, would, hold on, I would imagine that, it, like, it's really big in the States and, like, the English-speaking world because, like, it's English and it deals with, like, English subject matter um, or, or, or European subject matter. But I can't imagine, like, I don't know, someone in Siberia being all like, I watched the BBC. Uh, BBC News, I'm looking at the website here. Languages, uh, I, I don't even recognise what some of these are, to be honest. There's oh, loads of languages Oh, that's really here. interesting. Huh. Yeah. Uh, Azerbaijan, um, Nayak Khan, I don't know what that is. Uh, just Turkish. Yeah, loads and loads of different languages. All right, but so they, um, they're, but they're just getting the regular BBC content translated into their language. I'm assuming no, I'm, like uh, it'll be localized content as well. Oh, well, oh, that means the BBC is way more far-reaching than I think of it as. Remember, like the British were were a colonial empire. <laughs> you oh know? yeah, there was o that up thing. until like the fifties. <laughs> so you know, in the in the era of like mass modern communication, they they still you know, ran India and, and stuff. So... Yeah. And, you know, the the like the World Service was was a big thing for, for, like, a lot of the 20th century and that. Yeah, that's that's fair. I don't, I don't yeah. know why I didn't realise. Vietnamese? Makes... Vietnamese. They have it in Vietnamese, yeah. Oh. Huh, cool. Very cool. So it's in a West African pigeon. Yeah. Uh, do you know the name of this pigeon? We can put it in the show notes. West African pigeon. Oh, it's called West African pigeon. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were being generic. Is it like I didn't want to attempt to pronounce the name of the thing, so I'm just going to call it a West African pigeon. Oh, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I'll West put African the, pigeon I'll... English, also called Guinea Coast Creole English. But uh, oh no, is that, maybe that's an older one. Uh, no, that's that's it. That's it. 
Huh, that's interesting. I, yeah. Just on the on the subject of conlanging uh, pigeons, I think uh, we spoke last show about cultural appropriation and mm. being the authority uh, about a certain culture. I think yeah. pigeon, you can quickly get into these territories where you're kind of like, you know the way I think everyone has a cursory understanding of kind of like that Jamaican pigeon where it's kind of like, it's like, I don't know, on the outside, it seems like very English, just spoken with a really, really heavy Jamaican accent. And I feel yeah. like if you don't actually delve into this correctly, you're potentially going to produce something that's rather offensive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, absolutely. Especially, especially if you're doing a real world thing, like if it's like a far future thing, like in The Expanse, where you have like the South African thing. If you don't kind of come at that with a bit of sensitivity, I think it could go really like badly, really fast. Yeah. So I suppose that's just a point worth considering. Yeah, I mean, if if you're if you're trying to use real life examples to to make a pigeon, you, it's a, an area you should probably be careful. Yeah, obviously, if you just make up your con line and call the pigeon, well, there's no problem. Like you're only offending your con culture if you do it wrong. Uh, <laughs> do you know, and you are literally their god, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that's cool. That's really interesting. Links in the show notes, all that. So you go yeah. go check it out. Um, and I wonder, I, oh, sorry. I just uh, as a last point, I wondered like uh, what, what the limits. It it seems like a very vague thing to 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 realistically define. What what a pigeon and what a creole is? No, I'm sure I'm sure there there is a a, a difference. Um, I'm sure there is a difference, but I like I don't understand why you couldn't consider English to be a creole because it's a Germanic substrate and a lot of Germanic vocabulary, mostly Germanic grammar, and then all these inherited Romance ideas um, after the Norman invasion. Um, mm, uh, this is completely unfounded on anything i'm just going on feelings here so i'm liable to be wrong but isn't it the idea that it's like like english is not mutually intelligible with german right they're two distinct different things but like when i listen to like say that jamaican creole i can follow like 80 percent of it because it's like based on the rules of english grammar there's very many english words i think there's I think English Possibly, has gone yeah. too far to be called a, a, a pigeon because it's not mutually intelligible or at least not mutually intelligible enough to a degree at which it could still be called a pigeon. Yeah, I mean, like, I, 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 could, I can't follow everything on that on that uh, BBC West African pigeon site. I can follow some of it and I can figure stuff out if I think about it, but it's not, it's not like, fully intelligible to me. Right, but if, and if you put on the BBC Vietnamese thing, you're not going to follow any of it. Um, right. Such that, so yeah. that, that's what I think. What the distinction is, I, I don't know. Okay. I haven't looked into this. That's me just just exposing a, a question. Sorry, this is going on way longer than I intended. But uh, so pigeons and creoles happen when two different cultures kind of meet and their ma- uh, languages mingle. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. So why does it? Why is this not like happened in Ireland? Like, why don't we have an Irish English pigeon? Why don't we all speak a pigeon here? Like, we had loads of English people over here for like loads, and we had our native language before. Why is it that we didn't do that and just hopped on the English train and just almost abandoned Irish? We speak Irish with a lot of, or we speak English with a lot of uh, features that are not present in English English. Hmm. Like, genuinely, it's. It, I have had conversations where I've had to keep myself in check because if I knew if I just spoke casually as I would with you or with any of my other native Irish friends, English people would not understand me. Mm, so, oh, what are I you wonder, after doing? What are you after doing? <laughs> That's that doesn't make any sense to someone who speaks British English. <sighs> or what are you at? Yeah, okay, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, yeah, I wonder how far removed we are then from a legit pigeon. I don't know, but you see, mm. and some of that, some of that is a direct translation of Irish grammar, like at, right, like yeah. so in 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 Hiberno English, um, for our listeners, at like what are you at means what are you doing, mm-hmm. yeah, okay, and in Irish, the the particle egg ag. Um, is used as is it as the gerund as the gerund? I can't remember how to pronounce that word. Gerund, yeah, yeah. It's like the, like the ing. Yeah. Like I uh, Tom egg kind. I am speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's but it's also the verb to be at something like to to be like at a location, 
And I think that's how that becomes, what are you at? Meaning, what are you doing in Hiberno-English? Ha, huh, that's really interesting. I am yeah. going to Google and see whether or not Irish Hiberno English is anywhere close to a pigeon because I like I'm imagining. I opened the Hiberno English Wikipedia page a few minutes ago and I control F for pigeon and I didn't get any results. Yeah, yeah, um, and I didn't get any for Creole either. I mean, I I, I think that I, I I know there is a distinction between them. I'm not sure which what the difference is, but um, hmm, that's interesting. Jesus, maybe I might actually tr- there's something for later. Maybe try and make an Irish English pigeon. <laughs> huh. I don't know. Maybe we'll see. I'll put it on the list. Um. Anyhow. Anyhow. Uh. Anything else in the mailbag? In the mailbag. Um. So that was the first one. We got an email from a listener, Michelle. Um. Uh. Who said she's been watching your videos on world building, and during one of them, you mentioned that a race with no nose couldn't produce any nasal sounds. Yes. Which got me thinking of the Avox from the Hunger Games, slaves who have had their tongues removed so they can't speak. Uh, I thought it might be cool to invent a conland that did not use the tongue so that the Avox might use to communicate with each other. Um, oh, which that's, is pretty cool. That's pretty cool. It's going to be really difficult to do. Um, yeah, I reckon it, it would be. But I think you could definitely do something. Yeah, the problem is, like, you you have a whole lot of options when it comes to consonants, like, uh, like, B, for, B, for example, yeah. like, that doesn't really require the tongue, um, like, H, H, doesn't really require the tongue as well, but, like, what, yeah, are you, what, are you, what are you, what are you, yeah, what are you going to do for vowels, though, that's the, like, vowels require your tongue, well, actually, mm, rounded and open, like, the, the rounded, unrounded, and closed open axes don't. Well, that's so you've got you've got you've got two axes that you could work on. Well, that's fair, and also, I mean, like when you take it into the terms of singing, singers are constantly like doing weird things with their tongue that they wouldn't do in normal speech to accommodate that, but it still comes out as sounding okay. Um, mm-hmm. So maybe there is a thing where they could like, yeah, maybe they could still make vowel sounds. I don't know. Oh, do you know what you could do? Like even if you couldn't, even if you had no axes to work on, you could just bring in tone. Because tone oh, isn't yeah, a fu- you tone. Could. Tone isn't a function of of a tongue. You could just like have, or you, you could even have like loudness variants there. That's really interesting, actually. Now that I think about it. Yeah. Huh. You could have like yeah, maybe one or two vowels, and then a whole raft of tones on them. Yeah. And then. Um. What else you could. I mean, if you really wanted to, to double up on kind of the information density, take it like because all the things that you don't have your tongue for, you could, uh, you could distinguish between p and p, p like the the adjective. You could, or you could even you could distinguish adjectives. You could even distinguish between uh, aspirated and non-aspirated. Yeah. So p and then. Huh? I, ca- I can't do it. But like one, uh, the, the test for this, dear listener, is put your hand in front of your mouth and say uh, a word like pat. And pat. then, yeah, and then say a word like, uh, let me think, tap. tap. You should, with the with the p at the end of tap, there should be like a noticeable gust of air. At but the end of tap. At the end of tap. Because in yeah. English, we aspirate all those final p's. But pat there shouldn't be that noticeable gust of air. Now, we in English, we don't care about this, but I, I'm, going, I'm yeah, probably going to get this wrong. That's hard for me now. It is hard, but I'm probably going to get this wrong. But I, I believe in in Sanskrit, I could be wrong, I'll correct it in, in the next show if I am, but I believe they they distinguish between aspirated and unaspirated. So they'd have a word like pat with no accompanying puff of, a puff of air and a word like pat with an accompanying puff of air and they'll yeah. distinguish those as two separate words. So you could do that as well in the tongueless language. Um, yeah, yeah. That, actually, that is vastly more interesting than I gave it credit for initially. I was kind of like, "Oh, that's a neat idea." Now that I think about it, I'm kind of like that is a really, really interesting constraint. Yeah, um, and then obviously we talked about before, but we could obviously have signing, like yes. a, a sign language, or yeah. like uh, you can incorporate like percussive elements from around the body, and that could also uh, uh, come into your language. Uh, uh, I'm fairly sure that sign languages have been observed to arise like kind of spontaneously um like in 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 schools and things in in like small communities where i think uh signers didn't have 
previous exposure to sign language that coherent languages uh like just arose. Um, huh. I think I could I could be wrong about that, but I think it did. I read that before. Um, so it'll be interesting to to see like if you had enough like AVOX, if you had enough people who were missing some like significant feature of sound production that is used in language, if like they could come up with a mode of communication among themselves. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, like, totally. I that's see, pretty cool. I don't. I mean, it might be harder as adults, but um. Because, you know, you're so used to thinking in whatever your first or other languages are that it might be hard to, to kind of generate one. Right, but um, needs must, you know, the need to survive and to be able to communicate and say like, oh, the, the yeah. you know, the terrible, horrible guard is coming right now. We need to be able to say that. Um, yeah. I definitely could see it happening. That's really interesting. Dear listener, if you happen to get working on this, send us feedback on it. I'd love to, I'd love to see... I'd love to see what you what you're done with it, or whether or not you agree or disagree with what we're saying. Uh, yeah, a, a, a phonemic inventory would be class if you want to supply that. That would be great. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, uh, what else is in the mailbag there? Uh, got one more I want to look at from Sid H. Cool. Um, and he just very uh, brief question: Are you going to do country building? How about flag building? Well, I think we've covered flag building uh, pretty comprehensively. There was a, an episode a while ago about all like different shapes of flags as well. Um, but just in terms of good design and then assigning whatever meanings or symbolisms you want to whatever's on the flag. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's a, a lot more to say about that. Just you know, consider, consider its function, consider its social context and work on those work from that basis um country building that's that's an interesting one it's a very very broad question i mean what do you what do you mean by country building if you're talking about culture we've talked a fair bit about culture um and and different different elements of it uh if you if you're talking about the stuff you see on a wikipedia info box when you look up romania and you know, see its population and area and GDP and, and that stuff. Um, we haven't really done that kind of thing. Um, that's something we maybe could get around to at some stage. It's it's not something I'm qualified to talk about at all. Um, no, to be fair, Bill, none of us are qualified to talk about any of this. <laughs> like, I am not. I am not an astrophysicist. Well, that's fair. We'd actually we spend little to no time like like world building music, the actual thing we're qualified to do. Like, I am not an astrophysicist. <laughs> I am not a linguist. Neither are you for both on both of those counts. But yeah, we still somehow manage to find a way to talk I'm about a, these things. I'm a language enthusiast. Exactly. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's the, the thing is, it's just it's very broad. Um, countries are uh, kind of these made up entities. In, in in the same way that, I mean in the same way that like you know languages is just this thing that we do it doesn't it doesn't have the same uh, kind of concrete quality to it that stars and planets do uh, so I think it's a case it's it's a humanities question in a lot of ways and it's a case of identifying what it is that you you are interested in about countries what it is that you want to build when you country build and put that together you know, go research that and work on that task. I have responses. Yep. Uh, response number one is, uh, not not with regards to podcasts, with regards to videos, uh, I will be doing in the very, very near future a video on one of those topics. I'll let you try and figure out which one that is. <laughs> Just as a little teaser. Um, the, the thing about the country. <laughs> oh no, I'm talking to the listener. Yeah. As in dear listener. Country building, flag oh. building, one of those things will be covered in a very, very, oh. very, uh, like, yeah, it's it's the next one, I think. I think the next video is meant to be one of those topics. But, like, in the sort of, like, ever sort of dangling the fish in front of uh, in front of the internet, I'm like, I don't want to tell you too much. We'll wait to see. Um, but the, in terms of the country building, uh, two things that I think might be worth doing. Um. And this is outside of the, like, figuring out how many people and there are and all that sort of jazz. Like, I think country building, at least in the way I'm defining it, is a lot to do with legal stuff. 
like how we define a country, what are the rules of those country, how it governs, things like that. Uh, I think two things you should yeah. do is you should read constitutions of countries. I think that's really important. I don't know if we've talked about it on the show before, but uh, you should read the South African Constitution. The South African Constitution is easily digestible. It's quite small, and it's considered by many political um, scientists and academics as being an example of a particularly great constitution. Um, read that and try and pull elements from it to form your country, because the constitution is basically the country made manifest on paper. Um, so that's the thing to do. And then by extension, I would advise listening to uh, law podcasts, if you can. Like More Perfect is a good example. I'll leave links in the show notes where they talk about like um, decisions that courts have made that affect the country as a whole. Um, and those things can help build into the country building aspect. But yeah, mm -hmm. overall constitution and when you're done reading the south african constitution read the irish uh, constitution just as a a counter argument for what is like a bad constitution because our constitution is trash <laughs> so read the good ones and read the bad ones and come up with something based off that is my response uh, to that yeah yeah and um, i'd add to that uh consider like the the foundations of what we think of as countries because it's quite a modern um concept in a lot of ways i mean you know 500 years ago we you know we knew there were like there were italians and there were germans and there were spaniards but there wasn't an italy and a germany there was a spain i guess but there wasn't in like the an italy and a germany in the sense of that there was the country of italy and the the state of germany they were uh they were divided up among different uh, polities um and like westphalian sovereignty is a really important uh, theoretical concept in the, con the the creation of the idea of nation states. Hmm. Yeah, and then also there's like the idea of city states as well. Like a country, we uh, we tend to think of a country as being like a big landmass that is all like relatively yeah. homogenous, but like obviously city states. So there's yeah, I suppose it gets back yeah. to your original point that what exactly is a country and what are you doing? Um, yeah. What, what like what are the the assumptions that the question makes? It's it's always important to question the those assumptions. That's that's a very good point. God, I I really find this aspect of world building the hardest to do because it's it's so like nebulous. Mm -hmm. It's like it's kind of it could be like there's no right answer. Like I I, li I like the sort of like um, geo fiction because it's like there is a right answer. There are equations that govern the laws of nature. I can use those to make a thing that's realistic. But when it comes to like you know making a legal system or or a country or a culture, you're kind of like well. Could be anything, really, <laughs> you know. Uh, that that I find so difficult. Um, this is why it's good to have you around, Bill. In a balance to this. Um, but I hope I hope that helped in some way. Uh, the subreddit. Let us know. Let us know if you got any any other thoughts on that. We can we can all learn a bit from one another. You know. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Uh, anything else in the mailbag, or should we crack into writers' room? I think we should crack into the the writer's room. Yes, the newly it's, newly formatted. It's sticking. The it's name sticking. is sticking. FYI, the emails uh, we and follow up. Uh, we should call that the mail room. It was suggested in the subreddit. I think it's a great idea. Mail room, Ooh. writer's room, green room, done. Beautiful. Uh, you did some world building this month. I did do some world building this month. Uh, care to tell me all about said world building? Okay, so I've sent you a picture. You have. And I have sent you a little bit of prose. The prose, as ever, is a work in progress, but nonetheless, I sent it to you. Links in the um, show notes for everyone. So, TLDR, it's a map with context in prose, yeah? It, yeah, it won't be it won't be a work in progress when, when the, the listeners read it. It'll be it'll be finished then. Cool. Very good, very good. Uh, yeah, so it's a map and some some pros. So sort of, a, I guess maybe it's a kind of a gazetteer of the northern region of the planet of Fasath. So new planet, new planet, new planet. Okay, cool. Fasath, yeah. Uh, Fasath. Fasath. Cool. Okay, very cool. A A T H. There's a, no, there's a T H at the end. Cool. Cool. Um, uh, why new planet? 
Why do we choose to do this? Um, it's been in my head for a little while, and there was some kind of specific things that I I, I thought were cool. Uh, that I was like, oh, I should use that in world building, and um, I put them together. So just just from a, a quick read of it, what what is your what are your impressions? And we'll see how close to the mark I hit. Oh, okay. So my TLDR, I don't know how accurate it's going to mm-hmm. be, is that you have created a desert planet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you seem to have mapped centered around the poles, which is kind of a, a cool sort of uh, thing to do. Yeah. And it mm-hmm. seems to be a, a sort of heavily fantasy setting. Uh, you have like a winged sentient species, like um, like harpies. Uh, so mm-hmm. I think you use the word harpies to describe them, don't you? I do use the word harpies. Yeah, and so it, there seems to be, uh, it's like a, a, f- a, a fantastical Tatooine. <laughs> All right. What, what are you thinking? I don't know Tatooine that well, but uh, it's, yeah, it certainly is a desert planet. Um, yeah, so I, I did a map centered around the North Pole of this planet. Cool. And you're exactly right, it's a desert planet. And in creating this, I actually read up about planets on, kind of on the inner edge of habitable zones and uh, theor- like uh, works that suggest that habitable zones could be a lot closer to stars than mm-hmm. or is usually suggested uh, if the, the situations on the surface are correct. And there's a specific paper um, by... Uh, Andras Jam and others called towards the minimum inner edge distance of the habitable zone. Oh, which cool! I think you can you can find online. Yeah, you need to link me to that. I I don't think I've come across that. That's interesting. Link me. Oh, I I thought I'd sent you that before. Yeah, I absolutely I absolutely will. I, cool. I mean, I, I can no no. I'll send you a link rather than the PDF because then you can link it to others. Yeah. Um And now it's it's a little while ago that I, that I did this reading um, and initially started the map. I've just updated and done the pros for for this month. Um, but it, it kind of talks a lot about how you can actually get a lot closer to a star um, and what the situations, what, what circumstances could lead to that. So I decided that I'd take that and make this a desert planet quite close to a star. Ha- have you ran the numbers on this? Can you tell me how close is close? Um, I can if you give me a moment. I will give you all the moments you need, sir. Okay, so the habitable zone is... Point, or say 1.048 AU to 1.51 AU. Uh, what's the size of the star at, at the at the center? Uh, 1.05 Sol. So it's like slightly slightly larger than Earth. Okay, so you have, you, you're going to have it in a similar Earth. Like it, its year is going to be roughly equivalent to Earth. Then it's roughly at the well, same no, distance. because the desert planet is a 0.612 AU. Oh, you brought it into 0.61. Mm-hmm. Oh, you can do that? Seems like it might be plausible according to this paper. Hmm. Now, I didn't understand everything in the paper, but I, I, you know, it seemed not entirely out of the question. Wow. And so, so like, what are, you, what are you doing to make that plausible? Um, I'll have to reread the paper again to be sure. <laughs> uh, but basically, there's, the surface water isn't really very possible. Uh, there, there certainly won't be any large bodies of surface water, and the atmospheric conditions and the the it has to have a, a high albedo, I think. Um, okay. Like very very low greenhouse effect stuff like that. Okay, okay. So you oh so basically you've made the planet uh super reflective basically, and ergo you can push it closer to the star. It's just going to like pump out uh, the it's going to reflect most of the starlight back, so dropping the temperature and still keeping things er- yeah. like relatively habitable. Cool, very yeah. cool. And it, it won't it won't have a, a high surface pressure um, and it won't have a, 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 a very insulating atmosphere. Hmm, and so you've ran the temperature... Have, have you ran temperature equations? Like, do you know that the temperature checks out? I have not. Oh, could all hinge on that, Bill. <laughs> could all hinge on... But you on see, I don't, know, I don't know what the atmospheric composition is, so... But you don't need the atmospheric 
comp. Actually, do you know what's interesting, right? The, the, the video, dear listener, bit of inside baseball. Uh, I've been working on a new video about Albedo and it is finished and ready to be published at the end of this podcast. And interestingly, this video should help Bill with his temperature thing because you don't necessarily need to know what the uh, atmospheric composition is. Um, right. I have uh, found a very Seems nice like calculator. to account for greenhouse effects and stuff. Yeah, yeah. You see, now, hold on. I, I have found a really nice calculator made by the uh, Department of Astronomy in Indiana University, Bloomington, where you you just set you just kind of set a value for greenhouse effect you don't necessarily have mm. to worry about like what is causing the uh, greenhouse effect like what what uh, what molecules are doing it it's just a value that like uh alters the equation and you can run the whole numbers through this thing and then you get yeah. it spits out a cool number uh you should watch the next video bill it might be of some help <laughs> <laughs> but anyway this paper suggests that you could um the the inner edge of the habitable zone for hot desert worlds could be as close as 0.38 AU around a solar-like star. What? That's yep. that's close. <laughs> that's really it's close. very close. Um, where does it say that? Uh, if the greenhouse effect is reduced and the surface albedo is increased, we consider a wide range of atmospheric and planetary parameters, such as the mixing ratios of greenhouse gases... Uh, etc etc and it talks about a little bit about uh sustaining how you could sustain an active water cycle in a planet like this which is one of the things i did a, a fair bit of thinking about oh that's interesting huh cool mm-hmm. very cool so yeah um i was thinking it's a desert planet and i kind of i kind of tried to build on that and be like well what kind of material culture could they have then they're not going to have access to a lot of wood for example because a planet like this isn't going to have enough water to, to make trees a widespread uh, life form. Yeah. Which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, so they're going to be quite limited in their, their plant materials. Um, a lot of, they'll have a lot of you know, rock and access to metal and stuff, but you know, once they get metal, how do they treat it? What do they use for fuel if there's very little you know, vegetable material to burn and so on? Um, so I'd imagine that there'd be there'd be a, a fairly low material wealth and low ma- kind of material technology. Um, in 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 some respects on on this this planet, uh, about the water cycle, um, you'll see here at, at the very center of the map. There's well near the center. There's the Great Northern Range, mm-hmm. which is a mountain range, and there's kind of a a, a splotch kind of above that, right in the middle, mm-hmm. and that's the polar ice cap, because uh, you know even on a on a desert planet, you're gonna have the very very extreme north that's gonna have the you know the, the bit of uh, endless night at some point during the year, and um, so there would be there would be an ice cap, um, and I figured that you could still get water in on very high mountains. So if there's very very high mountains, you could get water condensing at the top or or falling in in uh, as perspiration, as precipitation, at the top, and that way you could replenish aquifers in the ground, and you could get glaciers and things, and that there would be a chance for sustaining a water cycle through that. It would fall in the mountains, or it would condense in the mountains and travel through the rock, and then you could get like a, a system where the reservoir was aquifers rather than the ocean. Hmm, and like. So I'm assuming this is why you've placed uh this city called Amtlar in the in the Trosh Mountains there on the left of the map. Yeah. Now, so then, what's the story with the other city, like Il Ilki? Ilki. Il Ilki. <laughs> what's the story with that? Yeah, well, That's... it's it's kind of a k sound, kind of a clicky kind of cue. Oh. Um. Well, do you see that dotted line? Yes. That is a huge canal oh. that takes water, glacial meltwater from the North Pole and carries it hundreds and hundreds of miles south to the city. Ah, uh, okay. So thus allowing them to live kind of in the open desert, so to speak. Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, actually, that, that city is built at a, a kind of... Uh, a confluence of a number of... So there's that canal... And also, uh, do you know what canats are? 
No, I seen this in your pros, and I was going to ask what the hell that is. So go for it. Okay, these are cool as heck. <laughs> um, it's originated in Iran, I think, or in, in in like ancient Persia. And so basically, what it is, you've got a you've got a a village that needs water out on a plain, right? Mm-hmm. And say there's a there's a mountain, you know, twenty miles away. What they do is they go up into the mountain and they dig down until they find water. They find groundwater. And now that's obviously way down in the ground. But because you're up a mountain, it's still slightly higher than the level of the village. So they dig a tunnel oh. sloping down, but it brings the groundwater to the surface. Cool. Yeah. And they've been, it's been like practiced for like millennia. It's it's really really old, and they like they go over vast vast distances. Hmm. Yeah, because my next response would have been like, seeing as you're going with a low material technology culture, like how are yeah. they doing this? But yeah, if it's been done for millennia, then that that like checks out perfectly. Yeah, and um, it cool. was. Yeah, the 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 Khanats of Ganabad is one of the oldest in the world, and it was built between seven hundred BC and five hundred BC. Uh, they were. Yeah, they were built in the in the first millennium BC. Cool, that's really cool. Yeah, um, yeah. You should, it's definitely worth a look. Put put the the Wikipedia link in the in the show notes. It's it's really it's really cool. Cool, very cool. And come here. What's so what's going on? Like obviously the little blodgy bits or little splodgy bits are mountains. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's altitude. Yeah. Now, what is going on around the canyon lands where you have like narrow lines and dotted lines and the Great Bite? What's that all about? Okay, so the Great Bight is kind of a, a huge basin. It's a huge salt plain. And then these these narrow lines are just huge canyons. So, so like, really, really long canyons. There's one here, Orlen, the East Canyon, is stretches from the Great Northern Range towards the Great Bight. And then Ketian, the West Canyon, stretches from the Troche Mountains, kind of curves north and then a little bit south again towards the Great Bight. And then where, where they near where they meet, there's, like, a... a very complex, like loads and loads of canyons and like smaller systems and interlinked systems. Um, I'd imagine it'd be a bit like the Valles Marineris in on Mars. On Mars, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this is one of the main areas of human habitation. But there's no like big cities there the way that uh, Ilki is. It's just like a it's a, a lot of lands um, and smaller settlements. Oh, cool! I, that's I think that's a really good so- a segue into. Can you tell me about the culture? Um, there isn't a culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a it, there's a lot of various cultures. There's a number of various cultures. Um, I'm I'm thinking I might try and write up uh, a sort of a creation myth and like history of humanity on Fasath and you know, where the different groups come from and their their own stories about how they they settled and how how they spread around. And the the creation of Ilki, um, no, you know, a great migration to the other side of the planet to to build this garden city. Hmm. I, I, for listeners, uh, if anyone is embarking on creation myth creation, uh, I'm going to throw the Crash Course playlist in the show notes because they do a, a really cool and easy to digest sort of crash course on mythology, and I think it's it's good world building fodder. So I'm going to throw it in. Cool. Uh, yeah, so as I said, there's a lot of cultures, um, and I'd imagine that there would be kind of nomadic cultures that would move around in the deserts, and there would be, uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, there'd probably be other smaller settlements around, but Ilki is like the big city, and then the Canyonlands is where most sort of human civilization would be would be centered. Uh, and what's the story of Amplar? Is that just another city, or is that got any sort of significance? Ah, sorry, yes, Amplar is uh, the the city of harpies. So it's kind of a, a monstrous city inhabited by kind of winged humanoids. Uh, here, I've spoken a little bit before about planetary romance as a genre. Yes, yes. And uh, this is very much uh, uh, inspired by, or kind of an homage to, uh, a novel by Robert E. Howard, who's the guy who wrote Conan. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um. Although Edgar Rice Burroughs is the person more associated with, with planetary romance, 
Edgar, uh, Robert E. Howard wrote one, at least, called Almuric. Right. Um, and it was about a guy who, who gets sent to this planet, Almuric, and um, leads the humans there in a war against these horrible winged people who are uh, kidnapping all their women. Uh, uh, okay, so hold on. So, so the, the denizens of Amplar are harpies, but everyone else is human? Or like in, like humanoid? Uh, on Fasath. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, everyone else is, is humanish. Oh, okay. And then you just have this harpy city. And then, like, yeah. uh, uh, the choice of harpies is literally just because it's in that book and you wanted to pay homage? Or is there any particular reason why harpies? I mean, I know winged people <laughs> who kidnap you are pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Ah, oh, that's really cool. Huh. No, yeah, I didn't really think any more of it than that. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. No, I like. It's cool. I, I like. I when you first sent it, I was like, mm, "Desert planet." But like, it's cool that you really thought about like how they are going to get water. It's a little bit more in depth than I'm a moisture farmer in the Star Wars sort of sense. I like the fact that you've kind of <laughs> almost taking like an engineering approach to solving this. And then I like the yeah. I like the little bit of like fantasy with the the harpies and yeah, it's cool. Yeah. And then also from a mapping perspective, I think it's just really cool to have it centered around the pole because again. Um, I think many, many maps are usually just a standard sort of like Google or sort of, or Google maps sort of just yeah. looking at the side of the planet, if you know what I mean. Um, we tend to forget that there's a top and bottom and we can kind of look at them in that direction. So I think that's really cool. Yeah. Um, View Dune actually has a map with, with a very similar projection based around the, the, the pole. I have um, never least... seen a Dune map before. Yeah. Huh. Or at least the copy of Dune I had that does. Um, oh, to, yeah, to talk about the... That. You can see it there? Look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you have it to hand? <laughs> I... Oh, no, no. Like, I, I don't read books. Uh, but I'm just... I'm Google imaging. Oh, yeah. Cool. Oh, okay. Very cool. Anyway, sorry. You were going to say? Um, so, the this map is obviously centered on the North Pole. And then these rings are um, 15 degrees. So, here, the Great Northern Range. It's Southern Limit here. The very southern limit, like by Orlen, is a little bit further south than seventy five degrees, okay. and then the next ring is sixty and forty five and thirty. So we get, we end up at thirty degrees south. Or oh, th- thirty degrees north. We don't go down to the equator. No. Ah, and w- no. and what's going on in the rest of the planet? Is there anything interesting, or just you've decided to limit it um, to this location? I well, I've limited it to this location for the moment because. The, the deserts are so kind of harsh that you can't pass you you can't actually go over land to the to the south the, the southern hemisphere um even if this goes from the north pole to 30 degrees north then that's that's still not like that much of the planet's actual surface and the majority would still be between 30 north and 30 south and then have an equal sized place um, at the south pole or around the south pole um, and I'm just thinking, like, in, in between is just impassable desert. This is an interesting point, and I think it's one worth reiterating. reiterating um, the sense that uh, I think people forget sometimes that geography can be a huge driver of story. Mm. And, like, this idea of, yeah, like, around the equator of the planet is going to be, like, scorching hot such that you can't pass it. And that's, that's an interesting yeah. thing you should think about trying to set up a little bit. Uh, such that you can create a narrative around like the other the other good example i can think of is the sort of pangea style thing uh we've talked yeah. about before where the the internal the internal parts of a pangea like continent are, will necessarily be extremely hot and extremely arid such that it would be very difficult for characters to say get from coast a to coast b um yeah and that's an interesting thing to do as opposed to kind of saying people can just go all around the world like the way we can with planes and things like that. It's it's nice to set up these little limitations. I think that's a really cool bit of local flavor and one that I think is worth yeah. taking on board. Exactly. Um, now, this planet is a bit smaller than Earth. Um, so the, the, the scales we brought down, but just like as, as a kind of a context, 30th parallel north is roughly, it, it goes through like northern Florida and it goes through like North Africa like the kind of Egypt is would be on on the thirtieth parallel north, and it goes through like it touches the south of Japan, the very the very southern tip of Japan. 
Okay. So that's kind of where we're at. This, and then ha, 30th ha, ha, this, this makes no sense to me. Can, can, can you give me a radius of the planet? What? Can you give me a radius of your planet? Then I'll understand size. <laughs> like we're we're gonna now we're gonna align the various different parallels up with Earth to get an idea of size. Just give me a radius, man. Have you got a radius? Yeah. Yeah. What the what? Five thousand one hundred kilometers. Oh, he d- look at him and his real units. Okay, hold on. I have to wait. I have to do some maths. Hold on. Are you trying to figure out the the area? No, uh, no. I'm just trying to figure out what that is in Earth radii. Okay, but why why do you need the radius? Because then I can tell how big the planet yeah. is. Okay, but that's not relevant to the point I was making. Were you were you not? Oh, I thought you were lining up all the different latitudes to give you an idea about scale relative to Earth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and in that sense, but just give me a radius. You don't no you you don't you don't need the 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 radius of this planet for that to make sense. What? Hmm. Okay. Okay. Continue with your point. Maybe you'll... you know if you'd let if you'd let me finish. It well, that's sense. that's that's, <laughs> that's entirely fair. So you continue with your point, and then I'll ask you. I'll run my calculations, and if it still makes sense, if it makes sense, great. If it doesn't, then at least I know what I'm talking about. So go for it. Right. So that's where the thirtieth parallel north is on Earth, right? Okay. Um. It, it go. It kind of Southern California, Florida, North Africa, Southern tip of Japan. Right. And then thirtieth parallel south is pretty much goes through uh, South Africa and uh, South Australia. So if you imagine all of that region, like that that was easily, I can say, ha- more than half of the surface of the Earth. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's the point I'm making. Um, so even though I've got quite a bit covered here, uh, it's still a huge, a huge um, portion of the, of the planet is left unmapped and is assumed to be impassable desert. Okay, okay. So, uh, do you get me? Uh, uh, not entirely. Do, do you, do okay. you want to just give me do you want to just give me your uh, your radius again? 5,100. 5,000, okay, 100. Oh, God damn a calculator. Ah, oh, ads, go away ads. Oh, oh actually, I do, I do have it in, in uh, relative to Earth. <laughs> and that would be? It's point eight. Yeah, it's point eight. Okay, so it's point eight times. Okay, yeah. See now, 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 now I understand what's going on. God, that was that was. I maybe maybe to the listeners it'll make sense, but I'm kind of like, what what just happened for the last five minutes? <laughs> the planet is a little bit smaller, and the vast vast majority a uh, majority of it is impassable desert. Yeah, the the point I'm making <laughs> is even if we're, we're we're mapping from the poles to thirty degrees north or south respectively. That's still not actually as much of the surface of the planet as you might think at first. Yes, yes, that's fair. That's fair. There we go. There. And Don't. knowing the radius is relevant to that point. Fifteen minutes later. Well, no, it's just because I don't know. It's the way I think. I'm I'm imagining the Earth, and now I'm imagining a a ball inside the Earth that's a little bit like twenty percent smaller. And then I'm imagining, like, obviously you try to explain exactly what's going on with the parallels. Now I'm just imagining that, like. 80% of that is impassable desert, and I'm kind of tracing in my mind your map on top of this globe. If that makes sense. Yes. <laughs> uh, so yeah, is there any more points on that? Um, you asked me what, what lies beyond, or uh, what, what, what else there is in the planet, uh, and although I said <laughs> it is impassable, you know, there are like rumours and stories, and you know, presumably people could do it like by going via magic or via space or something um there's tales of a city called mound mound a giant city yes um and extra points to anyone who can figure out where i'm going with that and a tribe of nomads that sail across the sand sandbenders no no i read that in your prose and i was like oh it's very much like avatar oh it's really cool Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah. Like, there's, um, y- you know the Avatar thing where it's like you bend the elements and then yeah. a-, a sort of subset of earth bending is people who live in di- uh, desert biomes bend sand and they use it to, like, basically sail on sand. They create, like, sand waves. And it's just cool. It's just really cool. No, this, um, this is legit sailing. This is legit sailing. <laughs> uh, oh, it's cool. I'm intrigued about this mound thing. Where are you going with mound? 
Is this something that I might know? Or is this like... Uh, I think I've probably mentioned this thing that I think is really cool before. Can I make a really tired joke? Go on. Is it something to do with Napoleon? No. <laughs> Damn it. That's all I have, Bill. Um, all I have. Whenever you say something like, you know, it, it, listeners who know me will understand where I'm going. I'm, immediately, I'm always kind of like... You oh, think she's... I'm one-dimensional. Edgar, I'm a complex person. You are a complex person, but a lot of that complexity is hidden under the veil of Napoleon. <laughs> No, it isn't. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, huh. Okay. If someone can crack builds on a code here, I want to know because I don't. I don't really have any idea. It's much like how I how I kind of came up with Ilki because I was like, you know what, a cool canats. Canats are cool as heck. Um, and I kind of expanded on that idea, and I got that city, and I was like, you know what would be cool if I did this. Um, mm. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so yeah, it's cool. I like it, man. Thank you. As always, I think it's very, very good. And I'm always in awe of your uh, your culture building ability because this, this stuff baffles me. And I like numbers. Cool. All right. Uh, anything Thank else to add? Uh, Thank you You're welcome. Very much. Uh, anything else to add? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think. I think that's it for my, for my world building for the, the month. Uh, links in the show notes. You can go check it out. Uh, let us know what you think in the subreddit. Now, I was bad this this month i did not do world building um only this month <laughs> i love why it's kind of become a bit of a gag uh yeah i've had a absolute nightmare of a time with this latest video uh i've been like animating for like seven days straight because i decided like an absolute idiot to rejigger my entire workflow to, like thinking that mm. it would be more efficient but it was horrifically not so all the time I had set aside for doing some amount of world building was taken up with animating, which I finished last night at 1 a.m. Uh, Excellent. So, <laughs> so yeah, no, no world building for me, unfortunately. But if it's okay with you, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the, my last video I made. There's a couple of responses that I think I want to just put on air uh, and then sure. also ask you some questions because uh, I think they're valid questions for world builders in general. Cool. Or more specific, sure. more specifically, conlangers in general. So, uh, po- so the, the the video I'm referring to, it's going to be in the show notes. It was called "Types of Conlang," and the general trust of it was try to try and let people know about the general categories there are of language, such that if you're the type of person that likes like boxes and building like this particular type of thing, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Personally, I think they're quite useful because it takes this big nebulous thing that is language and breaks it down a little bit such that it's a little bit easier to work towards. Um, That was my intent. But, and I feel like I executed that quite well, but it was probably the most, it was a weird one. It was like the video was fairly well received, but the linguists kind of tore it apart. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so I don't know how I understand that is. I think it has value in that it it uh, opened people's eyes to this sort of thing, but I think it doesn't go into enough detail for the linguists and the hardcore conlangers to like think it's okay. So just a couple of uh, points, right? Okay. Point number one, uh, people brought up. They really did not like the title. They they thought the title was uh, completely inappropriate, uh, and I'm. I'm conflicted. I don't know. And this is why I want to bring it up. The their, the main trust of the argument was that it wasn't a type of conlang. Uh, I wasn't presenting types of conlang. I was presenting types of language. Like types of conlang are like yeah. art lang or like an interlingua and things like that. And I wanted to get your thoughts on this. Do you think that that was a good move? Or can you understand why I did that move from the perspective of someone on the outside? Uh, or do you agree that it's like completely misleading? It's like, okay, you shouldn't have called a type of conline because that's not... It's not completely misleading. No, it's not completely misleading. It's kind of misleading, <laughs> I would think. And also it's kind of incomplete because because it's types of language in general, so it's not conline specific. You, you are right that it is a way of... You, you could, in theory, classify conlangs this way. Because it, because languages are classified this way, and um, but because it's a thing that languages in general can be classified this way, it is a it is a bit misleading. So 
my thoughts here. We talked a little bit before, I think on air, mm-hmm. about ethical swearing. I think this... What? we talk- Yeah, did I not talk to you about my thing about ethical swearing? Don't think so. Okay, all right. I apologize if this has already been mentioned on the podcast, but ever since like the start of Artifact Scene, I've always thought to myself, maybe I should swear a lot in my videos. Um, from the for for the reason that what I am doing on the face of it sounds scientific, but isn't because like we're we're world building. We're not like I'm not telling people good science per se. Uh, I'm just telling yeah. people like here. This is what we know from science. Here's how we can kind of, kind of, sort of mess with a bit to like produce all of these like hypothetical results. So I always thought the idea of like if I swear a lot in my videos, it'll stop those videos getting used in educational settings. Um, <laughs> because I have, I had. I, well, that's not. It's not. Re- what do you want? Do you want? <laughs> is that not just a really good idea? I thought that was a really good idea. <laughs> I, okay. I guess All right, listen like, up, you f-ing kids. Right, we're gonna f-ing learn today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I I remember the uh, I made a video about what's in orbit, and I got right. an email from someone being like, uh, "I my professor showed us this in class today," and like there was part of me was kind of like, "That's really great," but the other part of me was like, "Man, my stuff shouldn't be in a classroom. Like that's like okay. If, that's up for the pres- professor to decide. Mm. Not you." Uh, mm, I, I think it is up for me to decide because I I can't spend the words to every single time I make a point always say, by the way, this isn't, you know, accurate science or linguistics. Like, I, like all the videos oh, yeah. are treble oh. in length. So I can't say that. So ergo, on the face of it, you might look at it and be like, yeah, that's, that's, that, that is presented like a, you know, an informative short video outlining all the details, but I don't know. But it's 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 not your responsibility to make sure that that professor does their job correctly and and chooses good chooses good materials. You never know. They may have uh like made those uh, caveats themselves. Well, that's fair, but taking it away from the professor, let's let's do it to like a learner at home, like someone who is doing, right. I don't know, orbital mechanics in high school if that's a thing. Uh, they yeah. go home, they look on YouTube and they're like, oh, his video on orbits, that's really interesting. But again, I, I like, because I'm not spending the words to explain every time, like, like this is a gross simplification of what is actual science because we don't want to do calculus here. Um, yeah. That, that sometimes feel, it makes you feel but, bad. Anyhow, long but if, it, Sorry, go on. No matter if you did swear, if, if you cursed every other word someone could still use your materials in that situation if they're going home and looking at themselves yeah yeah the cursing stops the professor situation uh or or stops the situation of like uh and it also just makes it seem less academic and less kind of like this is education it it puts it more into the realms of um of entertainment um edutainment edutainment anyhow point being point being uh, this is all to say, this is why I chose the title of Types of Conlang, because if I thought, I thought about calling it like language types, but then I was like, someone who is just interested in linguistics is going to look at this and be like, this is what the language types are. When I'm making gross simplifications to just try and present like five or six neat small boxes to conlangers, not to actually try and, uh reveal what actual linguists think about the state of language in the world. So this is why I went with types of conlang yeah. to signal to people that this is not a linguistic video. Under that guise, do you still think it's misleading? Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's worrying. <laughs> I I still think I made the right call. It's just I totally get how it can be misleading, but I still think types of language have been Lending too much legitimacy to a thing that's about conlang. Not to say that conlang. But, but you make all those caveats in the video itself several times. Uh, well, there's a, but again, there's an awful lot I don't caveat, like uh, polysynthetic languages, for example. I don't really get into what makes them polysynthetic at all, and the stuff that I say is like 
correct, but on a very cursory reading of it. Because the purpose is to just is to just literally outline, you know, here's your boxes, bang, bang, bang. You'll need to know this for future conlang videos. So there's a whole lot about polysynthetic yeah. languages that from the perspective of like say hardcore conlangers who are into making them is in quotes wrong. And again, I didn't make caveats there because we'll be making caveats all day long. Uh, so I thought that calling a conlang was the right call, uh, but clearly not. And that's terrible. So I apologize, internet. Um, I'm sorry. I'll do better next time. <laughs> <laughs> so the other point, the second point, is Chinese. Oh, Chinese. How it has been the bane of my existence. Uh, I got torn apart on reddit and for good reason too like i'm not i'm not bitter at all like i think it's great that people point me out point out my stuff and keep me on my toes but i got hey demolished anger yeah go on anger how it has been the bane of your existence how it has been what how i don't understand because that's the chinese that's that's the mandarin word for, i probably butchered the the tones here but that's the mandarin word for good how Ah, huh. You probably hey. have butchered the tones. And all of all of the internet's going to get on to you, man. People care about Chinese. It's crazy. Um, anyway. Well, it's uh, point, good. I was what? pretty good at the tones when I, when I... I was pretty good at the tones when I did Chinese. You did Chinese? Yeah. I didn't know that. That's crazy. Yeah, how I did, far... I did how, a summer course in, in, Chi- in Chinese when I was like 16. Huh. Wow. Why? Yeah. I don't know, there was a bunch of courses and that was the one that seemed kind of cool. Hmm, interesting. You were pretty good at the yeah. tones. A, a, a digression before we start talking about uh, Chinese in relation to the video. Um, I had the privilege uh, in my old job of uh, doing a video with uh, like a 10-year-old, or he's 11 now, I think. I think 11-year-old uh, like prodigy child of a pianist. All right. And uh, he he's a Chinese, he's a Chinese Irish uh, chap and he's a lovely kid and the family are amazing and really cool. And uh, he, he had this concert going on and it was to celebrate Chinese New Year. So we had the idea of doing a video both in English and in Chinese. And it was really fascinating listening to himself and his mother um, work on his Chinese because he's not like he's a fluent speaker, but he hasn't developed the nuanced um, tonal approach yet yeah and it was and like it was really interesting hearing his mother say things like oh yeah you need to say this word with five going to three so i had always like thought that this idea of breaking tones into like a hierarchical hierarchical numerical system was kind of just the way people explained it but it was really interesting to see native chinese speakers thinking about their tones like that because i had always assumed that they would just kind of make the sound and be like replicate this sound and then the person would replicate yeah. it and they'd say yes or no based on how accurate it is. But they, they have like... Because when you're animated... teaching English, you don't say, oh no, you have to voice that, that concept. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. yeah. We don't say, yeah, please de-voice all plosives before unvoiced uh, like alveolar stops. Like that's just not a thing that happens. But they have this like analytical system based on my like sample case of one. So, you know, there's problems there. But that was fascinating to listen to. It was really interesting. And how, and I think I find it supremely interesting that they can tell the difference from, say, like a tonal dip from, like, say, five going to four or whatever, and like five going to one. Like the difference in how drastic the tonal shift is, is really audible yeah. to them. Five one sounds perfect. Oh, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> All right. If any musicians out there got that joke, well done. If you didn't get that joke, I'm not explaining it. It was a terrible joke. It was a terrible joke. <laughs> anyhow, so uh, fascinating thing uh, with the uh, uh, with Chinese here. But anyway, in the video, uh, I knew I wasn't going to pronounce my Chinese correctly because the tone things just I don't I don't get them. Um, so I kind of just made no attempt to get it right. Uh, I just said the things and was kind of like, this will be a really fun thing where people call out and be like, oh, look at the silly guy. He can't pronounce Chinese. Isn't it hilarious that he pronounced T as W or whatever? And this is not what happened, right? Like people were angry. People were like, don't do this on the internet. And I was like, Shit. and I was, I was really kind of like, oh, I've messed up here. So I have made a New Year's resolution, so to speak. 
and I think it's an interesting one. I am thinking about attempting to try and get native speakers to speak anything that needs to be said in the video. Okay. I think this would be a good call to do. It'll probably add a lot to my workload and I'll have to like, you know, cold call a whole load of people on like the Chinese subreddit, for example. Um, but if I can get people to actually just be like, hey, could you record this sentence into your phone and send it to me? That'd be awesome. I think that would be better and much more representative. And the idea of just like making a joke out of the fact that I can't speak Chinese is like after uh, the Chinese gate instance it isn't viable anymore. I think that's, yeah, I think I learned my lesson. <laughs> so what do you think? Like getting, getting out, would you feel perturbed if you had other voices on Artifexian that aren't, are, that aren't me? No, no, I, I welcome it. I'm sick of you. No. Yeah, I think, I think it's solid there. The, um, the, the problems, uh, uh, oh, sorry, it, w- would there be a technical problem with, with maintaining audio quality? I would be willing to overlook that. And I think most people would because like uh, when I think of videos like say Vox's videos, links in the show notes, if you're interested, they often call yeah. people like professors and things. And these people don't have sound equipment. Uh, so they're usually in their room using the built-in mic, uh, their laptop. And it kind of just becomes part of the vibe. So if you do it consistently enough, and like, you know, microphones on phones are good. Like, they're not terrible. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think it, co- it could work. And I suppose maybe taking the hit on the audio quality for a small little segment is worth actually being like, hey, this is what Chinese actually sounds like, as opposed to me purposely, purposely butchering it for the sake of humor. That just didn't land at all. <laughs> uh, so I don't know. I think that's the thing that we should try and do. It's, it'll be really tough if it's like, oh, here... Uh, let me see. I am going to uh, speak about ancient Sumerian, and now I'm going to cut to some native ancient Sumerian speaker, and that's just not going to be a thing, you know? No, no, it won't. But, I mean, you could ask a, a Sumerologist. A Sumerologist? Yeah, it's oh. someone who studies Sumeria. Oh, yeah, it could. It's I a good could, word, I, isn't it? It's a good word. I love I love the ology words. Just like tack ology onto a thing and just make these weird and wonderful words. I love it. Um, so anyway, that was that's point two I wanted to bring up. Apologies, internet, for totally butchering the Mandarin language and also endeavoring to do that better. Uh, final point, which isn't in the show notes, but I'm going to bring up under the guise of uh, what's called being sensitive to other cultures. Because I don't actually know what the correct answer is here, and I'm hoping that you might, or hoping someone in the Reddit is. Okay, people, people who are indigenous to the cold parts of America, Bill. What do you call them? Inuits. Inuits. Okay, the the term uh, Eskimo is that offensive? Um, I think it usually is. Yes, I think there are maybe some groups that that identify closer to that than to Inuit I don't know but it's generally a term to be avoided as far as I understand see because it, it's interesting I took because so with all these things about like what like certain languages are called or what certain cultures call themselves I always just defer all expertise to someone smarter than me so usually I try and use the terminology that I find in various papers mm-hmm. and the interesting thing is that in uh, one of the papers I was using to make that video uh, the writer used the term Eskimo and Native uh, American Indian all right. all the time in their paper. And so I was just like, okay, well, they've written a paper. So, I mean, you know, like, th- th- they know more than I. And then I put it in the video, not thinking anything of it. And I got a couple, not, not too many, but a couple of responses being like, that's really, really inappropriate. And I was like, oh, crap. Is it? Is it? Mm. But it's in a paper. So it's a weird one. I don't know where to stand here. And I, I I did some research into it, like like you said about how uh, it's sometimes offensive if it's kind of blanket. It's a blanket term over anyone in the cold parts of the uh, Northern America, but certain groups are Eskimo, as far as I can tell. And I think I was talking about those groups, but it just seems like it's this very, like it's this like hugely thriving cultural area that it's very hard to like categorize. Which we should we shouldn't categorize, obviously, but. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's useful to have words to talk about things very specifically. You know, I mean, it's not like 
you're, you're reducing everything to a single word for all purposes. But, you know, if it happens to be the appropriate word or the, the appropriate grouping for talking about a certain thing, then, you know, it's good to have a word for that grouping. That's fair. Yeah, that's fair. So anyways, in summation, just to make sure this doesn't go on too long about Edgar talking about how he's a uh, a sorry for everything. Uh, Internet. Apologies for misleading title. Internet. Apologies for not being able to speak Chinese. Internet. Apologies for, like, perhaps offending uh, Inuits and uh, Native Americans. I don't know. I still don't know. I still can't find any definitive thing and no one is, that has any consistent opinions. But like, apologies for all those things. I'm sorry. But at the same sense, the video did really well. <laughs> Just, like, it's crazy. Again, like, I think people like had so much, found so much value from it, even though there was all these points that like the more um, inside baseball people pointed out. So just to put them on the podcast to make, you know. What's inside baseball? Inside baseball means you are heavily involved in a sphere. In, in like, you know, like uh if i talk to you about the nuances of like football rules that no one would really know unless you were really 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 into football that would be an inside baseball thing or if you know i started talking to you about quantum entanglement and like all the various maths that goes on there that's a real inside baseball sort of thing okay Does that makes sense have you never heard that phrase before never huh Okay, inside baseball, it means that you're heavily involved in a endeavor and you know a lot about it. And in general, most people outside of that sphere don't care about your minutia. That's kind of like an inside baseball. Um, okay. So, yeah, anyhow, there you go. That's why I just want, no more building for me. I'm sorry. I just want to put all that on the podcast. And unless you have any other points to bring up, shall we motor into the green room? I think we should go to the green room. Let's do it. <laughs> Something fun happened the other day, a few days ago. Ooh. I um, I encountered an artifexophan in the wild. No way. Yeah. Huh. Let's do tell. I want to hear. It, it was actually on Facebook. Okay. In one of the groups I'm in, one of the the linguistics groups that I'm in. Um, I can't say the name on air. Um. And uh, someone commented on one of the threads, and I was like, wait a second, what's that profile picture? Is that profile picture what I think it is? And the profile picture was what I thought it was. Do you know what, I, do you know what it was? No, like, no. But it, it might bring us back to the last episode and the episode before. Oh, yes, yes, it was Bill Polian. <laughs> it was a Bill Polian. Exactly. Oh my God. Oh my god, whoever you are, dear person, thank you. Uh, I won't give the full name, but Graham, if you're listening, hello, and uh, nice to meet you online. Graham, you're the best person. Thank you so much. You've filled my heart with joy today. This is amazing. And the fact that it was like Bill Polian, and then Bill encounters the Bill Polian, I just, it's so good. <laughs> it was a weird experience for me, but I enjoyed it. Oh, that's amazing. That's class. That's really, really cool. Uh, it's it's fun meeting artifacts of fans. Um, it is. It's really cool, and it's it's fun when they because this is how it only ever happens. That it, it kind of comes out of nowhere. Like mm. you know, any times I've been recognised, it's suddenly like artifacts fan. You're like, oh my god, this is cool. And it's just it's really fun. Um, wait until they start spotting you in the street, Bill. That's going to be interesting. Yeah, but see, most of them won't know what I look like. You you put your face up all the time. I don't. Yeah. I've got one old photograph on the website, and then no. In fairness, I did a very accurate picture of me, but it's it's just it was just a, a drawing. It wasn't a a photograph of me. So whether I'm whether I am capable of being recognised, I don't know. Uh, to be fair, that picture of you is now gone. Has been replaced with a Bill Polian picture. All right. Well, there we go. <laughs> You didn't tell me you were doing that. <laughs> I no, I did. I was like, "Can did you?" Yeah, I no, I totally did. Oh, I was fair like, enough. I'm thinking about updating the pictures to my artifacts in Alien, and would you be okay with me putting Bill Pony in there? And you said yes, and I was like, "Thank you." <laughs> mm, fair enough. <laughs> no, because I, I, if I didn't ask you for your permission first, you, you know, that's potential to cause arguments. So, I'm like, no, no, I got, I got your. You can check the messages. I, I, I got your. No, no, I, I trust you. I trust you. Um, that's cool. Thanks, Graham. 
that's really cool. Um, so speaking of artifacts, you Bill, I have mm-hmm. a uh, artifacts year related story that I thought uh, I might share. Yeah. I met up with a guy called Brian. Uh, Brian is a YouTuber who runs the Real Engineering YouTube channel. Check it out. Links in show notes. Uh, it's a great channel. Like it's really well made, and his videos are really informed of it. They're just they're amazing, and the channel is huge. Like it's I think he has something like uh, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand subscribers. Like it's oh, cool. it's a very very big channel. Yeah, yeah, and it's been amassed in the space of a year. So like his stuff just blew up like out of nowhere. It was brilliant. Um, and so the guy's Irish. So I was, I thought I'd chance my arm one evening, just email and say, Hey, if you happen to live in Dublin, want to meet up, talk YouTube. Uh, and it turned out that that was feasible. So we met up the last day and we talked a lot about YouTube and it was super interesting listening to someone who is like doing this professionally, like properly professionally, listen to them talk about their methodology and, you know, what they do and strategies and things. Like that. It, was, it was really, really interesting. Um, but any, the most interesting thing that kept like getting pointed out to me was that although Artifexian, Artifexian is a small channel, it's like the view counts on my videos are like surprisingly good, like for non-viral videos in the sense yeah. that Brian, Brian kept making this point like that you seem to have like real like loyal fans and i know that sounds really like words like loyal fans seem kind of like you know it has bad connotations but just people who seem to like care about the the thing i make and that's not something that every channel has like lots of channels will go through extreme highs and then utter lows because no one's really there for the consistent sort of can't wait for the next video sort of thing so he kept praising uh, Artifexia and the Artifexian audience. And that just made me feel class. And I knew this already because I knew that I can always bank on a certain amount of views per video because I knew people want, I know people want to watch it. But to have an outside source say, hey, you've got a really great audience was just brilliant. And I just want to pass on to, to Artifexia. These are awesome. Like genuinely and quantifiably, you're awesome people. Uh, and this is a privilege that a lot of YouTubers, even big ones, don't necessarily have that people will consistently come back and consistently want to watch the stuff a person makes. So I am in a unique position and it's like an honor. And I just want to say thanks to Artifacts. Yeah. So to every single Artifacts fan out there, thank you. Uh, I, I agree. I mean, I, I didn't know that the, the metrics and, and the, the statistics were, were so positive though. I'm not surprised. Um, but we've also got a really nice kind of fan community. I think like, people are sound like we, we, we don't have we don't have obnoxious people appearing in the reddit we don't have obnoxious comments on youtube all that often it's uh yeah uh, but i i mean i mean some of my more widely viewed videos have had some uh, uh flavorful comments on them but that's just i think it's just what happens yeah. when you open up to a wider community but i think the like the kind of the core people who have been around since the very beginning and who kind of get yeah. the sort of like world building thing yeah they're really sound and particularly the subreddit as well because it's a much much smaller audience size uh yeah where i feel like i only see the podcast stuff on youtube i don't i don't see as as much of the the like the main youtube uh video channel stuff um but from my perspective you know we 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 have a a very pleasant community of comprised of pleasant individuals yeah and the thing is what's really cool i think at various points throughout making this podcast we have disagreed with our audience uh with people uh on various points uh the latest example i think would be i disagreed uh quite strongly with uh a user zen 10 about various points in star trek and what's class i think is that we can like battle it out and have this debate amongst ourselves like you know i think this and i think that and here's why and that and nothing ever nothing ever gets like nasty like no one ever crosses the line where it's like you know we start name calling things like that like we're willing to have solid debates and i think that's really cool and so it's just it's just great and like again to have someone else who's outside of the sphere just look at it from like an outsider and be like actually this is really good like this is a real amazing thing you got there is just it's just it's just so good like i can't i can't emphasize that enough and i can't i can't like 
pass that on strongly enough to greater artifacts yet. Like it's it really meant a lot. Like and it's been playing on my mind for the past few days. I've been really kind of like, do you know what? There is a possibility that this thing might actually work out in the long run, uh, and that's a really cool feeling to have. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Lads, thanks for being sound. Thanks for being sound. Thanks for not being. <laughs> <laughs> you have to beat that out so no one will know what you said <laughs> I know yeah exactly <laughs> uh, um, I have to apologise though because uh, oh. uh, on that, that thread the reddit thread for the episode about Star Trek I, I think I may have accidentally come across as though I was telling some, someone what they said was garbage and I didn't mean that I meant that the theme song to the Enterprise was garbage but I was writing the answer very quickly while I was on the on, on the way between two of my jobs and I, I was like a little bit behind schedule and I was like oh no I don't think that that is garbage and I meant that the song was garbage not not their opinion and I'm sorry if I came across as rude I think oh this is a, this has turned into a very lovey dovey green room here but <laughs> I think that yeah I, I remember that comment uh, I don't think it read like that like oh, I took it as in I would I thought that you think that the song is garbage not that you think the commenter's opinion is garbage. Um, oh, good. Uh, if, if the commenter took it up that way, please say this to Bill. Like, give out to Bill as much as you want. I'm, I I give you permission. It's totally cool. <laughs> You're so kind, Edgar. I am. I am. Um, but yeah, Such so there's... Uh, the Yeah, the, so that's the, I suppose two points in Artifexia. You met an Artifexia fan and then I, uh, I met a, a YouTuber. Um which is pretty cool. Uh, do you have mm-hmm. anything else? Anything else at all? Or ca- um, can I do the thing that I've been waiting to do for like literally two let years? Me think. He's going to take his time now. Watching. What have I been reading? <laughs> uh, I got back into Mad Men. I'm watching that again. Uh, okay, go ahead and do the thing. <laughs> actually, actually, oh no, I, uh, oh, can I make? Can I bring up Snow Crash? Yeah, go for is, it. Is that terrible? Do you have time to talk about Snow Crash? Of course we do. Well, what time is it? Yeah, it's only two o'clock. We've only been doing this for three for hours. Three hours. <laughs> Touch wood. Uh, the, okay, Snow Crash. It's a book uh, by... It is. Who wrote the book? Neil Stevenson. Neil Stevenson. Uh, so spoilers ahead for people. Just, you know, uh, watch out. Um, have you read the book, sir? I've read that book many times. <laughs> many times. I think that's a good thing then. I think you enjoyed this book. I mean, I haven't read it in years and years and years. Uh, I read it over and over from the age of about 13 to 16. Really? Um, yeah. Uh, what was it that, that caused this? Like, I just thought it was cool. Uh, it's... I don't know where I stand with this book. It is like... It, it, like I'm not... To be clear, I like the book. I'm not saying it's bad at all. But it's like... I'm not sure if it's like genius or crazy. Um, it, it blurs this line. It's like, I'm not sure if it's like really great world building or just mm-hmm. like madness. Like there's so much going on in this book. Uh, as a brief TLDR uh, of the book for people, uh, which, which is going <laughs> I'm to... I'm curious to see, to see someone attempt this. Okay. Which I was just about to say, this is, this is probably not going to go very well. Uh, but... Uh, Okay, in the briefest way I can possibly do this is we have two main characters. Mm -hmm. One of which, and this is, I think, literally the case, a sword fighting, a a samurai sword wielding computer hacker pizza delivery guy. Mm -hmm. And the other being like a skate punk espionage runner for the mafia. Uh, Mm, These two are... yeah. Yeah, these two are the main characters. And leaving out a whole ton of complexity at the middle, there's like this religious figure at the end who is seeking to spread this thing called the neuro-linguistical virus amongst the population. And the, the book deals with figuring out what this virus is. And the culminating point is that they, they take care of it and the bad guy doesn't sort of win. That TLDR is leaving out a whole ton of nuance in the middle. And most of the greatness about this book is in the describing how this neuro linguistical virus works and mm-hmm. how it transmits itself and things like that. Uh, but there's so much more to it. Like there's a whole, there's like this alternate 
they basically have like second life. Second life is a thing in their world. It's like this, they call it the metaverse and they can go there and they have digital avatars and the plot Mm -hmm. functions there. They have like cybernetic dog things that act as like security things. And then there's a whole load of, there's a whole load of weirdness going on. (laughs) So I don't know. I feel like I need to read this thing a couple of times to actually be able to appreciate it because yeah, it's just, it's so dense and it's so philosophical and there's so much in it like from computer science to linguistics to like just to like it's crazy like it's absolutely crazy and again i'm not entirely sure if this is brilliance or madness that you, you're going to get that a lot with neil stevenson <laughs> i've read most of his books um, is he a bit of i a, haven't read the most recent one is stevenson a bit of a one-trick pony in that it's always kind of linguistic computers future stuff no, um, language comes up a lot. Language does come up a lot. Um, computers comes up a lot. Sorry, no, sorry. Computers comes up a lot. Language comes up sometimes. Um, but he wrote, he wrote a book um, about uh, kind of about currency, I guess, and computers called crypt and, and cryptography called cryptonomicon, which is set. There's two timelines. It's yeah. set partially in the Second World War. And partially around 1998, which it was like around the time it was written, um, and that's that's quite. I haven't read it in a couple of years, but uh, I, I again, I, I really liked it when I was like seventeen. Um, then he wrote a sequel series to that. Well, he he wrote a a, a series connected to that afterwards called the Baroque Cycle, which was three volumes set between 1660 and 1720. Um, but basically building on the same themes. Huh. Uh, yeah, I, I reread some of that recently. Um, well, I've, I have a lot of thoughts about it. Uh, and he wrote, so he wrote Snow Crash. He wrote another book called The Diamond Age, which is potentially a kind of a sort of a distant sequel to Snow Crash, like not not in terms of plot or characters or anything, but a potential like a future of the setting, and uh, but dealing with very different stuff. Um, he's got a very good book called Anathame, which is a science fiction story about, a f- it's essentially about platonic idealism, uh, about like the, hmm. the philosophical concept of pl- platonic idealism. It's kind of like a science fiction in the name of the rose, kind huh. of, yeah, um, yeah, his, his books, they, they have a lot of information in them. And he's yeah. not shy about just like dumping in information about stuff, and that's part of what I really like about. It. Like he doesn't care that it's in a lot of ways that would be considered bad writing. He just puts it in, and that's what I like about it. That he doesn't care about it, and he, he he's obviously passionate about this topic, and he's going to bang on about it for a while. Yeah, that was one of my not so favorite parts of the book. Uh, in the middle of it, um, a hero, hero protagonist, our main character. Yeah. Uh, what you call it goes into this like digital library and he basically talks to this librarian avatar thing and the whole thing is just an excuse to basically dump a whole lo- lot about ancient Sumerian culture um, I- I'm not sure if it's real world ancient Sumerian culture or his fictional eyesed version of ancient Sumerian culture I don't know what it is I-, I think the mythology stuff is accurate right okay but yeah obviously them constructing a meta virus isn't like I get that but like I, I don't know how much is like accurately represented but in any case um that bit i felt a little bit tiresome where you know the hero would be like oh what is uh i don't know what is the nam shub of enki and then the librarian's going to be well let me tell you the nam shub of enki yeah. is a and then it just goes on i'm like this isn't a book this isn't it's this is an instruction manual this is like an it- edge <laughs> So it's like the educational tome. Like I should be taking a college course for this. It wasn't terrible. Like it was the the his his twisting of ancient Sumer was uh, engaging enough that I could put up with that. But yeah. had it not been such a wildly like a wild out there idea, I would have put the book down and been like, I'm not being lectured to in a sort of Weir's Martian sort of sense, where it's a whole load of numbers and information dump. You know. Mm. Um. Funny thing about about this uh, about this book, um, it wasn't the first person, uh, the first work or anything to use avatar to refer to 
someone's um like online representation but it was he he coined it independently i think and it was the one that popularized it so that, that when we say like an avatar on a forum or something that's from snow crash i mean i had a look at the wikipedia page a while ago and it seems like snow crash has inspired so much um in the digital world like so much yeah. of it can be drawn to snow crash which is that's an amazing feat as a writer yeah. to have such a influence on modern life uh, the, he, the, the, oh, sorry after you uh, the canonical example is that uh, i mentioned earlier second life the game mm-hmm. alternate reality thing that was big is still big i don't know but it was big a few no years ago um, and yeah. that is i think that's literally just like they wanted to recreate his metaverse his virtual reality that was explicitly their intention i think that's the case oh, yeah i didn't know that cool it's very much that they're like oh that metaverse thing is cool let's do that and let's call it second life yeah um so that's pretty cool there's a bit in one of his later novels and one of his more recent ones called um Reemdy, um where he's talking about uh it, it's set it's set in the real world um and he's talking about google earth and he like you know the character turns on the, the program Google Earth, and you know it zooms in and like you know you, you see the the Earth rise up from like kind of the black of space and you you zoom in down to the surface, uh, to wherever you're viewing, and he says, uh, oh it was you know the 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 classic Google Earth opening sequence inspired by some old science fiction novel. Hmm. The old science fiction novel that inspired the Google Earth opening thing, actually, and the, the concept of Google Earth. Is Snow Crash. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because you know the way he has that <laughs> planet thing in, in his library. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Yeah. That's crazy. Can you imagine, can you imagine leaving that much of a mark on the world? It's crazy. It's pretty Thank cool, you. isn't it? Uh, but, but so the, the main thing I wanted to ask you about, uh, and uh, by extension, the listeners, uh, what do you think of the centralized premise of this book? Like this whole, like, the, the metavirus thing and that, like, you can, uh, you can like I'm gonna I'm gonna do him. I'm not gonna do him justice in trying to TL the orders, but like you can speak a certain tongue, and that has the effect of like directly getting into your brain, your your spinal cord, or whatever, and like reprogramming how your how you work. Like essentially, a, literally a neuro linguistic virus. What what do you think about like that? Do you think it's like a little bit too far down the fantasy road, or fine? What what's your thoughts? I, mean, I don't think it's plausible but i think it works fine as a, as a cyberpunk conceit do you think there was times where i was a little bit drawn out of it like when they mentioned like oh yeah like you speak the nam shub of enki and then it like it, it like you know th- it affects your br- yeah. like brain canal i'm like ah ah lads like what what are you talking about this is and i get that it's science fiction and it's cyberpunk but there is a there comes a point well, where it's, it's kind of like cyberpunk post cyber yeah, yeah. cripple uh, but there comes a point where it's like this is a bit a bit too crazy. I think. Yeah. I don't know. I know. I, I, I mean, again, like uh, well, this is a thing I read originally half my life ago. So, um, to, to say that it has had a formative influence on me would would not be an overstatement. Um, so it may be hard for me to be objective about it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I I see what you mean, and it is kind of a silly idea, but you know, I think it works fine. Uh, do you know um, and it, it ties in nicely to uh, ideas about like memetics and how like information and ideas are literally viral like they're oh sorry not literally viral but they, they behave virally and this is just kind of a more literal uh iteration of that yeah um and you know will, the whole william burroughs thing of language is an alien virus you know it, it, and that's all stuff that i'm quite interested in already so it, it, it folds all that stuff together nicely it does. I just still think it takes it to a, a little bit too much of a silly, a silly extreme. But again, like, right. like he sets up the whole world that, it, it, like, it's quite sit, like satirical, anyways. Like the whole idea, like the guy is a the main guy is called hero protagonist. He delivers pizzas and he's the best sword fighter in the world, and all of this sort of craziness. Yeah. I don't. I don't think he he actually is. <laughs> to be honest, he just kind of likes to think of himself as such. <laughs> Oh yeah, but but in any way, this is a thing that is brought up. So I think yeah. at the very start, you're immediately aware that this is not entirely a like not serious, but it's like more satirical. So I suppose when you get to the yeah. damn shove of Enki bit, you're kind of like, okay, he's going to be a bit silly here. That's fine. Uh, I'll tell you one bit that I really just I just couldn't uh, suspend disbelief. I just it, it just didn't happen uh, when David 
uh, hero's hacker friend dies. Yeah. Because the idea being that this virus is, uh, it's like one of the forms it can take is a bitmap. And yeah. if you look at the bitmap, it'll like screw with your brain and the result is you'll die. And the whole thing where he goes in like, oh yeah, hackers are susceptible to looking at this bitmap, being able to understand the black and white dots because they think in binary. And I'm like, no, <laughs> what do you mean they think in binary? Are you telling me computer scientists sit there and go zero one one zero zero one one zero zero? Like, no, yeah. don't, it's just that was ridiculous. Like, and the fact that like a huge, not a huge, but a big chunk of like the driving force, like when that guy died was was caused by this sort of really silly idea. I was kind of like, ah, Stevenson doesn't know about this one. Yeah, no, that, I agree. That's that's a bit that that's a bit silly. But overall, I was going to bring that up actually. Oh, were you? Oh, good. Um, overall, it's an excellent book, and you should read it. And it's also really humorous and like badass female characters. The guy who's the one man nuclear powerhouse is just hilarious. <laughs> yeah, terrifying. <laughs> but it's terrifying and like comically hilarious, like hilarious as well. Yeah, you know, it's like, there's something quite nineties about it. Like it's 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 very like stuff that was cool in the nineties in yeah. a lot of ways, and it's it's it doesn't take itself overly seriously with them. Yeah, it's like if the Matrix had a sense of humor. <laughs> I think. I see what <laughs> you mean. Yeah, I can see what I can see what you're getting at with that. You're not hugely wrong. Uh, anyway, re- read the book if you haven't read it, and you've you're okay with the spoilers that we just went through. Read the book; it's really, really good. I, I promise you, you'll enjoy it. Uh, if you're anyway into science fiction, and just be prepared for some ludicrous bits. <laughs> Anyhow, Bill, shall, can I do the thing? Can I do the thing? I want to do nope, the thing. No, it's too late. Gotta go. It's nearly oh. two hours of recording. Gotta go. Bye. Oh, <laughs> I, thing. I have wanted to, since the dawn of this podcast, publish a video whilst doing the podcast. Right. Okay, hold on. I'm going to open YouTube. Are you going to try and get a first comment in or whatever? Oh, actually, maybe. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh all right okay let's do this so oh, dear, no, dear listener i i have finished the albedo video uh the one that has taken me many 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 days to animate it is all ready to go and even though sunday morning irish time is not a good time to publish a video i just really want to publish it on the podcast so there's a little record of it uh so bill i can hit publish at any time go for it i'm ready pub uh wait and we're <laughs> published <laughs> Published. Quick refresh, refresh. <laughs> oh, you're taking so long. Oh no! No, the mapping internet's... with temperature. Three seconds ago. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've never six seen... views. How do you have six views? Oh uh, no, no, they count as views when I go and put in all the annotations and stuff. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I usually. Okay. What well, out for the first comment? Quick, before someone else gets it. What out for first comment? First, obviously. No, that seems silly. That seems. No, that first, seems Bill. Tired. Do it. Don't think about it. Just do it, Bill. First question mark. <laughs> you better love that. I am going to. Oh yeah, YouTube has this weird. You can love comments. Um, are you? I, I, have you commented as the Artifacts in podcast or as Bill? No, McGrath? I've commented as Bill McGrath. Okay, hold on, hold on. Should I have commented as the podcast? No, no, no. That would have been like indulgent. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, let me let me go and. Uh, oh, there's three comments, Bill. There's three, what? Com- three comments. You may not be first. You may have missed the, an opportunity. Four comments, Bill. This is outrageous. And YouTube being excellent as always, not showing me any of said comments. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you are not first, Bill. Someone what? got in. Someone got in with 14 seconds. What? Well, God damn it. Oh, wait, no, sorry. No, no, sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry, Bill. Bill, sorry. What? I made I made a, grieve, a, gr- a grievous error. I, I messed up. I forgot how time works. This person commented 14 seconds ago. A go? A yeah, go. so I am first. You are first. I am, yeah! I have loved your thing, and now I'm going to pin it. <laughs> I have never done that before. I am going to pin it up to the top so you'll be there forevermore. 
Excellent. And for people to watch other podcasts, I realize this gag has been done in other podcasts before. I just really wanted to do it. I think it's quite fun. <laughs> okay, Bill, will I, will we call it there? I need to go actually call put it this on the Reddit and Twitter and things. So um, sure thing. let's call it there. And I will see you. I will see you next month. Yeah. See you later. Bye bye. Edgar out. Edgar out. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.